All right, and with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Moses Lee. Uh, Moses has been a part of the Center for Entrepreneurship in some form or fashion for many years. Uh, in fact, he was um, a faculty member or a, an instructor here at the Center for Entrepreneurship, helped with several of our classes in our practical hands-on classes, as well as um, a social entrepreneurship class. He's been involved in entrepreneurship for a long time and most recently started a company called Celio, which is an education technology company, which we'll have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about. Uh, that company was sold a couple years ago to KeyPath. So Moses had a very successful exit and uh, continues to be a mentor in the entrepreneurship community, uh, an advisor, and continues to be very involved in the education space. So we are thrilled to have him here. I'd like to welcome Moses Lee. Okay, great. i um, really excited to be here. Before we get started, I'd love you to turn to your neighbor and answer this question to each other very honestly. When you were growing up, what expectation did your parent or your, uh, maybe your um, guardian have for you that annoyed you the most? Okay, what expectation did your parent or guardian have for you that really bothered you or annoyed you the most? Okay, so we'll just spend a few minutes sharing that, open, very honest with one another, and then we'll get started. Uh, we have a few microphones. Uh, Dr. Matt Gibson here is going to go around with the microphone. Who wants to share? Or, okay, if, if you don't want to volunteer, if you heard someone share something really interesting, just volunteer that person. Okay, so let's raise your hands. Let's hear some people share with one another. This is going to be very therapeutic. I feel it. Okay. Who like to share? Don't be. Sh this is great. This is a great time to be vulnerable. Okay, here we go. Um, so it's not really something that annoyed me, but like I wanted to be an artist when I was little. And my parents said no. <laughs> so here I am. Not here an artist. you. Are, I, I hear you. Yeah, that's right. I understand Asian parents. You know, no way. <laughs> You're living poverty. That's right. That's right. I, yeah. All. I, I hear you. Don't live your dreams. Just make money. Um, okay, some other folks. Here, I think we saw a few hand here. We're in the middle. No? Oh, here we go. Um, my parents wanted me to play an instrument, and I didn't want to play an instrument. What instrument? They didn't care. They just wanted it to be an instrument. Okay, got it. Yeah. So all smart people play the piano. Others. Or like tests and stuff. If you got like a like a ninety two, it'd be like why why wasn't it a hundred? It wasn't like oh good job you got a ninety two. It was like why wasn't it a ninety? Yeah, why wasn't it a hundred? Never good enough. It it if you could get a hundred, you should get a hundred and five, right? Where's the extra credit? <laughs> why didn't you get the extra credit? Okay, move one more. This side of the room, I, I feel it. I'm feeling someone over here, just bold. Want to share? Boom! Okay. Here it is. Um, I heard the person behind me say that their parents expect them to go to like Harvard and MIT at like the same time, which is kind of like representative. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you get accepted to both Harvard and MIT and then get dual degrees there? That you. Sh <laughs> Why? Why? You're a huge disappointment, right? <laughs> when I was growing up. There's this, there's this term nowadays called Tiger Moms. And a, a very famous book came out several years ago about this topic. And it was, it, the book is called Battle Hymn of a Tiger Mom. And when I was growing up, being an Asian American, my parents had high expectations for me, primarily because they wanted to compare me to other people. Uh, how many of you have been in a situation where parents are constantly comparing you maybe to other people. Okay, yeah. Johnny got into Harvard. Why not you? Uh, this person, concert piano. Why not you? Right? I mean, so there'd be these moments when I was growing up where the, there felt this weight of an expectation over me to be someone that perhaps I wasn't. 
My parents really wanted me to be a doctor when I was growing up. How many of you, anyone here, also parents, hey, you should be a doctor. And there was no real rhyme or reason behind this expectation. It was that doctors are respected, make a lot of money, therefore, you should be a doctor. And that was the type of environment that I grew up in. But for me, I had no interest in being a doctor. In fact, I actually interned while I was in high school at a hospital because my parents said, to get into college, you must intern somewhere. Why not at a hospital? And I was a receptionist. But they said, looks great on the college application. So I did it, but I was freaked out by needles. I mean, I was like, oh my goodness. Like, needles sticking me. I was like, there's no way. I cannot become a doctor. But I had a real passion for business. And so I, when I came to school here, I did my undergrad here, um, I really wanted to go into business. In fact, the only thing I really wanted to do was go to Wall Street, because I, I was a driven person. I loved achieving goals, and I wanted to build things, but not necessarily become a doctor. And so I headed down this path, because I thought being in business would be a great career for me. So when I was in college, to the discipline of my parents that I came here, because they expected certain ex uh, colleges, but I was like, hey, Michigan is an unbelievable school. Uh, I went to the business school and enrolled there. And I remember when I was on Wall Street, did a summer internship there. And again, the only reason I actually applied to business, uh, to, to get a job in, on Wall Street, was because when I got into the business school, that's what everyone else was doing. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be awesome. I was built for business, built for Wall Street. But when I was there, there was another huge disappointment because I actually felt like this guy in the office. <laughs> I was like, sometimes you aspire for something that you don't know what it is, and when you get there, you realize it's, it's not really what it was living up to be. And I remember sitting in my office in New York City, being completely depressed and saying, this isn't for me either. And I felt in my heart that both my parents and my community, one, I was a disappointment to them. Number two, I was a disappointment to the business school because everything about being in business school is about getting a consulting or investment banking job. And I was sitting there, I remember one night, thinking to myself, this is not for me. Little did I know that there were careers beyond banking, consulting, and becoming a doctor. I, <laughs> I was like, I remember going online and looking what kind of careers are out there, and I realized that there are millions of other jobs that are out there, but for most of my life, I actually was unaware of them. I felt like a fish trapped in a small little bowl wanting to leap out and to enter into an ocean that is full of life. And I think this hopefully illustrates a little bit about the desire to get out of this kind of constraining situation and leap into a life of freedom, the way that I was meant to be. So I made some drastic career moves after graduation. I decided instead of heading to Wall Street, I was gonna go travel the world. Many of us are aware of these gap year programs. I actually just took a gap year much later, um, after I'd graduated and gotten into debt. Right? So, that's, yeah, just do it later. Uh, at least you eventually do it. I had this idea in my mind. I went to this conference and was exposed to this idea about how business could not just be about making profits and making tons of money, but could be very impactful. And I actually got a job at a social enterprise organization and started traveling the world. And taking this risk led me to go to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to Ghana, to many different places, and start to just open my eyes, not only to the world, but to who I am as an individual. And I think for a lot of us in this room, we actually don't know who we are. We're just living by the expectations that either our parents or even your counselor has for you. You must be an engineer. You must be a doctor. But for me, it was a time of real self-discovery to realize who I am and what I'm about. That led me to apply for a job at the university. 
I came back from this journey, and I had written a lot of different case studies about enterprises at the base of the pyramid that were making positive social impact. And one thing that I realized is once you start publishing something, you become an expert. This is something that Matt will say often. If you go publish something, put something out online, people suddenly perceive you to be an expert. So I had put together a lot of different reports and got published by the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And there was an opportunity here at the University of Michigan to teach a class on social entrepreneurship, to develop case studies, to develop a curriculum. And I jumped at that opportunity and said, why not? This is a great opportunity for me to get in front of young people, expose them to some of the learnings that I had from the field. And I loved working with students. I loved working with students to build social enterprises, develop companies, launch their ideas. This opportunity led me to a middle school in Ann Arbor. Um, because again, once you're perceived to be a faculty member here, you're an expert. So I got invited to go to Scarlet Middle School here in Ann Arbor for something called Portfolio Day. Anyone ever hear of Portfolio Day or Scarlet Middle School? Anyone from around here? Well, Scarlet Middle School is an under-resourced and slightly disadvantaged school in Ann Arbor. And they have this event called Portfolio Day, where they bring in members from the community to meet with young people, and they have this binder of achievements and accomplishments that they show the professional in the area, and they get feedback. And I remember at that moment, looking at a number of these young students, and as I asked them, this is amazing. The work that you put in this portfolio is so incredible. Do you think you're going to be able to continue this when you get to high school? And their response shocked me. They said, no, because all that matters when I get to high school is having a GPA and a test score, because that's what it's all about. And I was thinking to myself, this is rather unfortunate that we have this entire system that is gearing young people to just take tests and get a number. And I was thinking to myself, you are more than a number. You're more than a GPA. And I remember that was an inspiration for me at that moment. And I said, we've got to do something about this. So number three, theme, in terms of ideas and how Celio came to life. I remember that sparked an idea, and I started talking to a lot of other people about it. I said, how can we provide a platform for students to showcase their passions and their interests and their achievements in a way that the world, colleges and employers, will actually recognize. And so, at that moment, I remember thinking to myself with some other people, we can either sit on this idea or we can act, act on it. And one of the first steps of any good entrepreneur is to go get out of the building and start talking to people. So one thing that my friends and I, uh, who I had met at my church, we were actually just really thinking about this idea a little bit more because we fundamentally believe that people have great value, inherent value, and they're meant to showcase that and make that, use their talents and their gifts and their treasures to impact the world. So we decided, we went out and started interviewing people. But we didn't want to just interview people in wealthy communities. We wanted to interview people across the spectrum of economic uh, livelihood. So we actually went and spent a lot of time in Detroit. And we actually talked to young people and asked them about who they are, their passions and their interests, and whether there would be an opportunity to create a technology platform to allow them to showcase their work. But one thing when we stepped out of the building and started interviewing people is we started to recognize that those that are in Ann Arbor have much more advantage technologically than people in Detroit. I remember spending an entire day in Detroit with some of my co-founders at the time. We actually didn't know what we were going to create. We just knew there was a problem. And we said to ourselves, we don't want to launch a technology platform because it's only going to further this gap between rich and poor. Because when we were in Detroit, we were talking to students and said, we don't even have technology in the home. And we can't create these digital assets to show people. It would actually widen the disparity. So we made a pivot. You probably heard about these things in books or even in this class. We said to ourselves, well, we don't want to contribute to social economic disparity. Where is there an opportunity to create something 
that could really showcase student talent. And we said, right under our noses at the University of Michigan. So we ended up interviewing college students here at the College of Engineering about their work and their passions and their projects. And they said to us, resumes aren't enough to capture who I am and what I'm capable of doing. We then went out and started interviewing employers. And we were, it was confirmed when we were reading the newspaper headlines and when we talked to employers that many employers don't want to see a resume. I remember talking to a few students in one of my classes, and they said to me, <clears throat> I look identical to my three friends on paper, but we are radically different. I remember talking to people who were recruiting out of Google and Facebook, and they said, well, the, maybe the resume gets you in the door, but I want to know a lot more about what you do outside of the classroom. I want to see your projects. I want to know what you're passionate about. But there isn't a really great way for us to glean those insights. And so our team said to ourselves, here's an opportunity. Here's a market. We actually believe technology can address some of these challenges that we're seeing in the market. And so what we decided to do without spending any money is I built a prototype on a PowerPoint, and it looked like this. It's horrible, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. This is the early version of Celio, but I simply, in five to 10 minutes, put together this PowerPoint slide, and we ended up showing it to a ton of recruiters, to students. And this is back in you know, 2011, 2012, and we got tons of feedback from the market without spending a lot of energy. And we realized during this time in this early prototype that we'd made that we were onto something. And our team was really excited because at the heart of hearts, we said, we can empower young people to tell their story in their fullest form rather than just relying on a score or a GPA. We decided to build a team because we felt that there was enough traction. And I think this quote here is something that really inspired us. And it's the following. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. When we were an early stage company, I had no money to offer to people to join our organization. I could only offer them inspiration and vision. And what we would say is we could revolutionize the way that young people present themselves so they can actually get a job that fits their passions and skills rather than just have a job. Find a calling versus just a job. And we had a lot of people who are into this. Now, finding a great team is really, really important because for those of you who have ever started something new, it is a, an emotional roller coaster. And we said, let's have people, let's form a team of people who are passionate about our cause, who are never going to say die, and we can support each other through this emotional volatility. And we were the form of a great founding team. And here's a picture of us early on, as you can see here. Um, great picture. As you can see, I am married and had a young little kid. And so part of my team as well was convincing my wife and my young little son to say, we're in this journey together because we're pursuing this vision. And it's not about money, but it's about changing the world. And we actually brought together several engineers. And these two people on the right, I'm gonna, I actually want to call them out. One, um, one became the first employee at Product Hunt later, um, years later. And the other actually joined on with LinkedIn um, several years after we had started. And we brought together this amazing team that was just passionate about entrepreneurship, and then passionate about bringing this idea to life. But we didn't have a lot of money. And that's where this opportunity came to me and said, well, we have this idea. We actually built a prototype. I need to raise capital, because many of these people need to eat. And one theme that lesson that I learned is you really need to find investment partners because we didn't have money at the time, and we we're like, oh my goodness, how are we going to survive? I remember my wife telling me and saying, you can't quit your job unless you know we're going to be able to feed our kids. And I'm like, all right, that's, that's logical. Uh, makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, and I said, well, right now we're just meeting late night and uh, we're not sure what's going to come out of it. And she said to me, well, you can do this probably for a period of time, but at some point this needs to be able to provide some income for our, not only our family, but also I need to be able to pay people who want to join the organization. So I remember feeling desperate to go out to raise capital. And I went out networking. I went and gave talks. I went and did meetups. I went to the U of M alumni network to see what I could do to raise money. And one of the most interesting things that came about was, again, my young little son. Um, my wife would plant a seed in him and he would say, oh, dad, what are you doing for, for work? And I said, well, I'm trying to start this company. And he goes, well, we have food. I'm like, absolutely. Well, I will, we will have food on the table. Because my wife, you know, thought it was really funny that have him be the messenger and say, make sure we can provide for the family. But I remember this was actually a big burden on my heart at the time. Like, oh, you're absolutely right. And it gave me extra motivation. So we went out aggressively to raise money around this idea. And I cannot speak to the network that we were able to find within the U of M community. And we were actually able to raise about $800,000 from several individuals who are connected to the university. The one that I want to call out in particular is a, uh, the former head of marketing at LinkedIn. And we got published by TechCrunch. And I got this email from this guy, Nate Johnson. And he said, read about your article, love to help. And he sent it from his Gmail account. So at the time, I was like, ah, oh, who is this guy? Just wants to get involved. And I, I, I remember not responding to the email for days. And then he emailed again. And I said, OK, let me, I'd love to chat with you. And he said, you know, I live in the Bay Area right now. I uh, used to run all of marketing for LinkedIn. I'd love to help out. I'm like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? I'm like, I should have responded early enough. But he said, I just want to help out an alum of the University of Michigan who's doing something that's really interesting to me. And because he said, LinkedIn, we're not doing well amongst college students or even high school students at the time. And we think there's an opportunity here. And so I'm like, absolutely. And I remember when we brought him on board, it became so much easier to raise money. Because I could tell investors and say, hey, guess what? This former head of marketing at LinkedIn is on our team. But one thing I really I recognize in all this, because there's people who just wanted to give money, is find investment partners and people who are going to help you build an organization and who are aligned with your mission. Those are the best kind of partners and investors. And we were able to build our company on the foundation, not only of these investors, but the people on our team who are really, really p passionate about this. We started to grow the company, and it went from you know, two to three employees to maybe 15 to 20. And I remember, as we started to grow the organization, we raised capital, we were hiring more people, we were moving to different office spaces, how important it was for me to keep vision fresh, not only for myself, but also for our teammates. And I would say for anyone here who aspires to be a leader of an organization or the founder of a company, it's so important to keep vision fresh. Why are you doing what you're doing? And I would say this not only just if you're running an organization, but if you're leading yourself. Often, many of you in this room, we're going to take a slight riff here, we go through K through 12 education, college, without ever asking the question of why am I doing this? What is my vision for my life? Where am I going with this? And you just kind of go through the system until you graduate. And societally, there's this huge term called the boomerang effect. You go through all these years of college, 20, 22 years uh, of schooling, and then you go back home and live with your parents. And you're underemployed. Part of it is because there is no vision. So number one, if you have no vision, get a vision for your life or your organization. And once you have it, continually remind yourself. And there would be seasons when we were growing as a company where it was really, really hard. We didn't know we were going to make it. I remember there's a, a time when we actually had to lay off a few people because we were pivoting the organization and going from a B to B B to C company to a B to B company. And we had to lay off some people. And during this time, we felt compelled to cast the vision and remind people why they signed up for this in the first place. But one way that we did it was like, let's look at the impact that we're making. And we often, as an organization, shared quotes to each other once a week 
to remind us of why we were doing this. And I just want to read this. I remember we got this quote, this is freaking awesome. This is so much more than just job seeker website. It really describes who you are, uh, you as a human being. I no longer feel like hurling myself off a bridge when thinking of job hunting. And so we were like, these are inspiring quotes that keep us going on our vision. This is an early phase of, uh, you know, beta launch of our site. But I remember when we launched our site, we had college students from across the country logging in to create a portfolio. And I remember we said this one girl from Princeton, who's an Olympic swimmer, she put her work on to our site. And I remember sharing with our organization, this is an absolute privilege that this woman chose our platform to showcase and tell her story to the world. Um, an MIT student logged in. Um, and again, we were doing no outreach, but he put all his robotics projects on and was using it to apply for a number of jobs. And he messaged us and said, this allowed me to communicate what I do in a much more powerful way than a bullet point on a resume. Um, I want to just talk about this woman. Her name is Chelsea Hunterson. And her story is a little, a little bit unique because uh, she applied to our company early on after graduating from the University of Michigan and said, I really love your vision. I want to work for you. And I remember getting her email, and I looked at the bottom, uh, you know, at the bottom, she says, you know, what school did I graduate from? And she said, it said, like, political science. And I remember responding back to her and said, well, we're a tech, ed tech company. I see no need to hire someone from a political science major. And she responded back, you didn't even look at my cilio. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, I've fallen into my own trap. I've fallen into my own trap. And I clicked on her cilio. And our team looked at her work, and we realized that she had all these skills that went beyond her degree. And we're like, we've got to hire her. And we did, and she was an amazing employee. She added tremendous value. And I share this story because it illustrates the problem that we're trying to solve, and how even I fell into the trap of the problem that we were trying to solve, of communicating who I am and what I can do rather than just my degree. In fact, I would even like to argue that for many of you in this room should be thinking about your education holistically, not just the school that you're a part of. And so this kept vision really, really fresh. And I, I want to kind of return back to this concept of you are made to be free. And for me just personally, I mean, I'll end on this and we'll do some Q&A here, but for me personally, when it came down, I had some time to really reflect, is I went through this life and I didn't really have a lot of time to really think about who I am and what I could be. But I was just really listening to the voices of my parents, the expectations of my school, and perhaps even peer pressure. And one thing that I've learned, and perhaps encouragement to you, is I know it sounds cliche, but you've got to really use this time in college to discover what it is that you're passionate about. And to recognize that there are millions of different types of jobs and careers out there than perhaps the ones that only you've been exposed to. And the third thing, I didn't even know what entrepreneurship really was when I was growing up. But I knew that I was the right fit for it. But I only discovered it over time by taking some risks, exposing myself to new people, new ideas. And I found that fit. And I cannot tell you. I talked to so many of my friends and my peers. They cannot stand their jobs right now. They hate, many of them feel in bondage to corporate America, to their mortgage, often feeling enslaved and they're doing something that they don't really, really like. It's not surprising that if you look at the stats out there, only 15% of workers actually like their job. I find that startling and quite profound that we have some of the most highly educated people in the world and when they end up in a job and in a long-term career that they don't like. There's something wrong with the system. And my encouragement to you and many of you in this room, you're interested in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is about empowering yourself to shape your future with the skills and the talents and the passions that you have so that you can be free not be enslaved to someone else's idea. 
for your life. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to wake up when you're 35, 40, and say, I'm living someone else's life. How can you free yourself from that and actually do and be what you were made to be? So that being said, I'm going to invite Matt up here. We're going to have some time of Q&A, um, as well as I think we're going to take some questions from the audience as well. Is that right? Yep. All right. Well, thanks, Moses. That All was right. uh, wonderful. So let's, uh, we just have a few questions. So the students are actually reading this book by Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. Yep. Deep, connect, deep connection to you. Yeah, deep connection. <laughs> Love Reid Hoffman. Uh, but one of the things that Reid Hoffman talks about is how entrepreneurs have a lot of curiosity and um, that they question a lot of things and they question uh, opportunity versus luck. Um, what are your views on, on being able to create opportunity or, or take advantage of luck? How has that played into your experiences? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... And we, we, you know, we're good, good friends, and I, I think the, um, we, we chat quite a bit. And um, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll give one story about this. My son right now, I'm convicted to create an environment where he's able to spot out opportunities. And so in our home, we try to create this culture of opportunity spotting. Yeah. And so one day, a balloon went all the way to the ceiling in our home, and he said... Let's take it down. And I said, what are five different ways that we could bring this balloon down? And so we started to brainstorm. He said, well, why don't we take the vacuum and see if we can suck it down? Uh, maybe I can uh, fly up there. So to that being said, <laughs> to, that, to, to this, I think... And he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> but I, I think in terms of luck opportunity, I mean, there's some people who just kind of think, I'm just going to wait and let life happen? Or are you intentional about putting yourselves into opportunities to learn, to discover, or even, even create a culture amongst your friends? Like, this sounds really hokey, but I, I remember I've been in so many car rides with other entrepreneurs, and you just instead of just listening to music and podcasts, you just start brainstorming and thinking of all sorts of different opportunities uh, that are out there, and using that time wisely. So, I, I, at least in my view, being intentional about finding opportunity creating a culture around you, around opportunity, really, I think, um, sets the tone. Yeah, yeah. You know, another theme um, that Reid Hoffman talks about is uh, what he calls intelligent risk-taking. And I think you talked about two different kinds of risks in your journey. So one is the risk of actually starting a company and maybe not being able to put food on the table. Yep. But the other risk, which you highlighted in particular at the end, is the risk of not doing what you were meant to do. Yes. So how, you know, do you have any suggestions on how students should try to manage those two types of risks? Yep. So, I mean, and we talk about this all the time. Students, this is the time to take risk. You're like in the mother's womb right now. <laughs> like, like right, in a university where in time of your life, you probably don't, there's this term called drag in your life. You don't have mortgage. We don't have, some of you probably don't have many children to feed, <laughs> right? Like, or, or things like that. Maybe in some, yeah, I mean, but you know, this is the time to take risks um, when you're young, uh, when you're in school. Um, and I, you know, even in this room when we're going around with the microphone, that's an opportunity to take a risk and say something. And how do you, how do people now take these opportunities with your summers, with your classes? And don't just get into this mode and say, okay, I gotta take the, 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 because I need to get this type of job at the end. But really explore yourself. Because I, mean, I, met, I remember even going through college, some people were just, I'm just gonna take these types of classes because this is the most optimal set. I don't care if that I'm interested in French literature or American history or any of these other things. I'm just gonna do this because this is my goal to get into this career. And then I remember even in looking back, many of them aren't even in that career right now. Yeah. And, and they said, oh, now I'm gonna take this time to explore who I am. And it, people just wait and delay and delay way too long. And I would say right now is your opportunity to you know use leverage the university. There's so many opportunities that they can you can explore right now and take certain risks um, that aren't really even that risky. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe that's my one advice yeah, for absolutely. students. Why don't we uh, see if any of the students have a couple of questions here? I see one hand. Moses, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for coming here. Um, so you're mainly uh, social entrepreneurship. And really what you've done is created a, plat a different platform for students to just really showcase 
their true talent, essentially. And so my question for you, it may be a little bit difficult, but it's okay, you can take your time. Um, <laughs> if you could sum up your life's purpose in one sentence, what would it be? And how do you think what you've done so far in your life has helped you reach that point? So um, I've recently spent some time reflecting upon life purpose with my wife. And there's several key phrases that um, we're really passionate about. Um, and they're active verbs. One is centered around teaching. And we really feel compelled that my wife and I and our family, we want to be people, we love education, we love teaching, we love presenting people with new ideas and ways of think. So teaching is very much involved in there. Um, the second verb is centered around mentorship slash discipleship. I mean, we, in general, want to pour our lives into raising next generation leaders. And the third one is investing. And it's not just investing our time and energy, but it's actually pouring financial resources into people or causes. Uh, I think for us, we've been fortunate because of the exit that we had that actually have financial resources. But one thing that we were very clear on as a family is that we're not going to increase our lifestyle just because we have more capital. In fact, we're going to steward it in a way that invests in people and in our communities and other causes that are really dear to us. Um, so those three active verbs, you know, uh, teaching, mentorship, and investing uh, are things that kind of guide uh, the way that our family is choosing to live. Hopefully that helps. That's great. Thank you. So right up front. Could you talk about the difference between what people are meant to do and what people are led to do by their peers and parents and sure. their expectations? Well, I mean, I think this is part of self-discovery. I think one is, you know, are you making a decision just because your peers are doing it? That's number one. Like, when you're in college, picking a job is probably the most lemming thing you could do, right? Lemming, you just fall off the cliff and everyone. You just go, oh, everyone's going to get go for that job. Everyone's going there. I mean, listen, when I was in college back in the 2000s, no one wanted to do tech. I mean, everything was banking, consulting, pre-med, and probably is somewhat still today, but <laughs> there's a lot of pressure to go down that path. But, you know, when tech companies come, they didn't have a lot of people going to them. Um, and, but, so... I mean, to some extent, what I'm sharing here is like, don't just apply for a job just because, oh, that's what everyone else, like really seriously consider what are your strengths, what are you good at, what are you passionate about, what do you really love to do? Uh, Matt and I talk with a lot of young people all the time, and we were surprised how often people don't know what they love to do, or have, or even cultivate their passions. Um, so I think that's part of it. It's like, if you could early on, and I think this is really important, Early on, try to figure out what you love to do, what you're passionate about, what you spend night and day thinking about. Um, I think that's the start. And then on a side note, colleges are now asking these questions because they recognize they don't want to just put people into the system. They want to have people come to their school to leverage their resources and do something amazing with it. Not just head down this traditional path as everyone has always done, but they want change makers. People are going to really shape the future. So I, I, don't, I hope, hope this kind of gives you some hint of, am I just doing this because my parents want me to do it or, my, or everyone else? And it actually takes a moment to reflect. Maybe this is the other thing, I'll get, up, get off my soapbox, is I know we're a very plugged in, wired generation, but if you actually <laughs> unplug for maybe 30 minutes and go for a walk, you'd be amazed at how much you would discover about who you are. And uh, maybe that's just a, one practical application. Other questions? Yes. Do you have any risks that you didn't take and you regret not taking at that time? At, at, throughout my life or at what time? Throughout college. College. Yes. Um, so, for example, every single summer, because at the time, all I wanted to do was be a banker. So every single summer, I just took a stand, like a, I worked at a brokerage firm uh, after my freshman year. Sophomore year, um, 
I, I think I went back there. Oh, I did trading um, on the Chicago Stock Exchange. It was actually a really crazy experience. It was on the floor, like, eh, I'm like trading all these commodities and futures. It was ridiculous. Uh, then I did an investment banking internship. And then, so it was just, I actually never took time to explore other things. And I kind of regret not using some of those earlier summers just to explore interesting things that I loved. Um, because I think you can, there's, there is the challenge of just trying to be too career focused right out of the gate um, versus just exploratory. So I kind of regret some of those summers, not using them and having fun. Well, Moses, thanks for spending some time with us. Uh, this was wonderful. I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed this time as well and was able to take something from it. So thank, thank you, you, Matt. Thank you. I think I'm a lot like you. <laughs> when I was uh, uh, a kid growing up in Flint, I had this burning desire to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to start a manufacturing company, an electronics manufacturing company. I wanted to be my thing. 